So um, let me just start by saying that we are doing here something really new. Um, and I think it's really important in this case that we give everything, every single thing literally, especially those aspects that we believe we know very well, a very fresh look. So it's true for us who try to do the things, but I also want to invite you to take the opportunity and let me give you a new perspective on most of the things that you already know. Now, I know that here are a lot of experts. So you will think I might even bore you with basics. But hold on, especially the cosmologists, until the end, because I can assure you there will be things that you have never heard of, or at least not in this context. And again, take the opportunity to give things a fresh look. What are we trying to do? So first of all, Paul already laid out the grand plan, his vision, and also conveyed this idea that what we are trying to do is imagining a universe that never on large scales encountered a quantum gravity regime. He also uh, already emphasized that this doesn't mean that we don't need a theory of quantum gravity. You just ask the question if it's theoretically possible to construct a model for the universe on large scales that, that would avoid this regime, and if it's possible, how could we distinguish it from other scenarios observationally? Now, it's really important in this case to formulate this question now in the mathematical language, because we are theorists, so at the end, we need some precise question that we can then answer, again, by using our usual tools of mathematics and experiment, and in between, of course, computers. So I don't have to introduce you the Hubble parameter, Paul already mentioned it to you. Uh, it is um, the logarithmic time derivative of the scale factor. And what you see here is simply a very, very simplistic um, graph of what the universe is doing during the large scale evolution. So we heard that during the correct current expansion phase, and by current expansion phase, I mean everything since what we dub the Big Bang, and we try to replace by a bounce or nuclear synthesis, we are expanding. And we know that according to Einstein gravity, this means that the Hubble parameter itself, just as Paul already mentioned you, or a Hubble horizon, the inverse of the Hubble parameter is growing, and therefore uh, the Hubble parameter's value is shrink, uh, shrinking. Which is really important also to note that the Hubble parameter sign, and again, there are a lot of experts, but it's not bad to reassert this, tells you about the velocity of the scale factor. So expansion means a positive sign for the Hubble parameter. The contracting phase, you also heard it. So we start an expanding phase from large energies and approaching today where we are out there, really small energies. And in a contracting phase, it's the opposite. The universe is shrinking, the Hubble horizon is shrinking, but because we are shrinking, the Hubble parameter is negative. So shrinking Hubble parameter means a positive absolute, growing absolute value for the Hubble parameter. And that Paul has shown you on the Friedman equation, this means growing total energy density. So when we are at the end of the contracting phase, where Paul left off, and somebody, uh, Mark asked, where are we? We could be at 10 to the 14 GeV or something like that. So we're below the Planck scale, but at pretty high energies that for us it wouldn't be very comfortable, as we made also clear a few minutes ago, then uh, that's where we are. And it's quite clear what we have to do when we want to bounce without reaching the quantum gravity regime, so having a classical non-singular bounces. We have to violate something that, in a more formal language of general relativity, called the null convergence condition. Uh, here you see the Ricci uh, tensor contracted by um, two null vectors. And no convergence condition in this language simply says that this quantity here has to be greater or equal to zero. Of course, many people uh, uh, work here on, on, on violating this condition. And when we are in Einstein gravity, we know that this condition equals to the null energy condition. So violating the null convergence condition would be violating this inequality. And at the same time, it would also mean violating the null energy condition. Now, I will be modifying gravity because we also know that if we followed Einstein gravity all the way through, then we would just crunch. And all the nice things that Paul was explaining would be possible would not be possible anymore because we couldn't, wouldn't know what happens and according to our current knowledge, might not be able to transmit anything what was prepared in the contracting phase. Of course, that would be the catastrophe for the model. 
So in modified gravity theories, though, on the other hand, it's in general not clear anymore that violating the null convergence condition, that is, making the Hubble parameter grow instead of shrinking, as in Einstein gravity, is equivalent, actually generically not equivalent to violating the null, converge, null energy condition. Therefore, a precise way of what I want to state is, is in order to bounce, we have to violate the null convergence condition in a smooth way. So the rest of the talk will be, how do we know what kind of models we think could do it? And what are the checks that we have to, that these models have to pass that we can even talk about viable, theoretically viable models that we can then subject to observational test. Uh, what I want to walk you through is starting from simple steps to more and more technical steps. And I will stop there where we are now. I think it's a good place where we are now, but I don't want to be overstating anything. We don't know yet if at the end of the day it will work. I just think that it looks good and we can go on to the next step, which was not quite clear a few months ago. So this, this will be my overall message. And now, please follow me through the first simple step what we check. Now, we all know that where we have to start is the simplest way, <laughs> the simplest step. We have to figure what if the theory that we propose should drive the bounds has a um, solution, a background solution, a homogeneous solution that admits a bound solution. Now, what, what do we need? I said that the ingredient what we need is we want to remain classical. But we know that we cannot use Einstein gravity. And at the same time, we want to have something that's well behaved. Now, if we are classical and want to have a theory that's well behaved and want to be as conservative as possible, uh, then we know that we need second order equation of motion. We need um, lo uh, Lorentz invariance or covariance. Or again, I'm staying in the simplest way. That's where we feel that we are on safe grounds. And if we want to be even simpler, uh, or more restrictive, we want to say we remain in the scalar tensor context. Because these are the elements, ingredients, that we feel most comfortable dealing with. And we know since the 70s, then, then there are not so many options we can take. As a matter of fact, there is a very small, close group of theories that we can work with, and these groups are called Kondesky theories. And they have this nice feature of being second order and being Lorentz invariant. Now, Instead of showing you the covariant Lagrangians, I want to start again. I want to proceed from simpler to more complicated steps. So I want to start here just to convey you what to the leading order, the homogeneous limit, what these theories would do. So what you see here is uh, a modification of the first and the second Friedman equation. Again, H is the Hubble parameter and H dot, the second Friedman equation, describes the time evolution, so the time derivative of the Hubble parameter. It's written in a convenient way so that the um, Negative Hubble parameter, in, as in Einstein gravity, we know would be, uh, as you saw it on uh, in, in Paul's talk, would be positive. This is written here also in this way. So if we were in Einstein gravity, it's a simple canonical scalar. Those functions, I should say, are all functions of the leading order of the kinetic energy of the scalar. We have this scalar field dropped it into Einstein gravity, and this scalar field now modifies Einstein gravity. The first two terms are just some sort of polynomials of the field and its kinetic energy. So what, what work is G2, many of you know, of course, is P of X theories. But for the non-expert, would, you would encounter them in, in a, just a gravitational theory where the scalar is minimally coupled to gravity but has some higher order kinetic terms. And you see the last two terms, both in the first and the second equation. So it's true also for the second row. The first two terms, would, you could encounter them if you're fairly comfortable with them. But the last two terms are the terms that already at leading order modify gravity. And you can see it from the fact, and this modification is also called braiding. Now, why was it dubbed by the fire braiding? Because you see that curvature terms, here the um, metric connection term evaluated to leading order. We know that H is either the three curvature on homogeneous background or represents the metric connection here, is coupled directly to the kinetic energy to the scalar. And the second uh, equation shows you even more we also see that the second derivative of the scalar goes into the uh, um, second uh, Friedman equation. This will be really important towards the end of the talk. This is a true modification of gravity, especially if you will then look at the dynamical structure of this theory. So it looks a little bit strange in the moment, but if you start working with this, and especially those who work with this know that these terms actually become eventually your friends. So 
hold it now. What we do with these terms in the moment is we verify that through this equation you can realize exactly what I have shown you. You can stop H shrinking during a contracting phase at a negative, uh, at a finite but high energy density, and to leading order can bounce and derive at a positive energy density. Of course, I should say for completeness, I'm not the first person to realize this. But these are neat theories because they have all the ingredients that we want to have. We just have to make them work. Okay, so test number one, that's easy to pass. We all know that's easy to pass. Now the next test is already not trivial. If you're a cosmologist, you know that having a background solution doesn't really mean anything. Since Slava and Paul taught us how to deal with uh, um, gravitational theories when we want to look at linear level, we know that what we really have to do is study how the linearized perturbations in the theory behave. And not just we have to study the linearized perturbations, we also know that the most convenient way of studying this perturbation is the use of gauge invariant variables. Now, really only just to that everybody is on the same page because I know that here are also people who are not cosmologists, and it's great. Um, what do we mean by this? So back in the 80s, uh, the problem that Jim Bardeen solved was how do we know, how do we distinguish between fluctuations that are due to our coordinate choice or time slide choice of the, of the, of the linearized perturbation due to the uh, coordinate invariance of general relativity? How do we distinguish these artifacts, these coordinate artifacts, from real physical fluctuations? As it turns out, not is, there is only a solution, but there is an extremely elegant solution that reduces the problem to study, instead of the 10 plus 1 scalar coupled, differential, partial differential equations, which are very nonlinear, coming from Einstein gravity, reduce this problem to studying three decoupled ordinary differential equations that describe the scalar, the tensor, and the vector modes. And in fact, when we smooth, so this is all common knowledge, we can even neglect the vector modes because we imagine that our um, background mechanism has already smoothed them out. And thanks to Slava, we have a very, very elegant way of extracting. It turns out the tensor modes are simple. They are gauge invariant, so they are invariant under infinitesimal coordinate transformation. So what we really have to look at, even the theories that I show you, we don't change them. Um, but that's one way of saying this for the experts is that we don't only couple the scalar field's kinetic energy to the three curvature, but we don't couple kinetic energies to four or higher curvature terms in the action. And therefore, the tensors are well behaved. So the only thing what we have to watch out for, even in these theories, is at this next step, we will get further, but in this very next step after we check the background, how do our scalar modes behave? And for this, we use this gauge invariant, kind of Sasaki variable in this theory. And just for, to show you the definition, this can be imagined if, so the formal definition of is this zeta minus h times zeta phi over phi dot. Here zeta is, you can think, at, think of it as the perturbation, the linearized perturbation to the spatial three metric uh, and scalar part thereof. And zeta phi is just a scalar field perturbation. And one can easily check that this variable is invariant under very small coordinate transformations. We call them infinitesimal coordinate transformation. And as I promised, we have the only thing what we have to look at is an ordinary differential equation for every co-moving wave number. It turns out that not only do the scalar tensor and vector modes decouple in this de uh, uh, decomposition of the Einstein equation on FRW background, FRW, I will call Friedman, Roberts, and Walker, but even every uh, uh, mode evolves differently. We are in Fourier space and K just denotes a co-moving wave number. And but so Z, Z, Z is just uh, some background function characterizing the background. So as we have learned for a long time since looking at basically the first person was introduced the term, and that's why it's also in my title, and the relativists will not be very happy with this title. I learned it already. But hold on, hold on, we will go on. So you will understand it was called gradient instability that you have to check. So what people meant by this is, in order to show that this ordinary differential equation that describes the evolution of the Mukan of Sasaki variable in this theory is well behaved, you have to need the it's called hyperbolicity of the system. You don't want to have any mode that grows faster than exponential. 
because then this wave number, uh, then, then, then the whole system breaks down and you cannot trust the prediction starting from some sort of initial condition. And that is encoded everything into what people call the sound speed or the propagation speed of the kind of Sasaki variable or, if you wish, the, uh, in Einstein gravity, the co-moving curvature mode, zeta, um, in unitary gauge, where you set the delta phi to zero, just for the experts again. Uh, then what you have to watch is that the sound speed remains um, square, sound speed remain squ square remains positive. And as it turns out, you can, in the, in, in the model that I was presenting at the background level, this is a very simple check. So it looks like that the bounds can be killed or verified basically within one line. Namely, if you see it, the sound speed can be described by, or is proportional, really to one qu quantity that's non-trivial. This is, we dub it the gamma quantity. And this gamma quantity is something that you can think of as a braiding parameter. And if you know the so-called effective field theory of these theories, is then people even call it uh, there the braiding parameter or braiding. And um, so, just so everybody is on the same page. In the Einstein limit, this parameter is just a Hubble parameter. And you measure by how much you modify gravity. You measure the strength of the interaction between the scalar kinetic energy and the tree metric or geometry by um, seeing, by measuring the deviation of this gamma parameter from H. But it plays also a very important role in describing the evolution of the gauge invariant curvature mode. Because you see this gamma, uh, the gamma, gamma's time derivative really determines about the sign of the sound speed squared. So that's what you have to keep um, positive. And there is a minus one that doesn't seem to be your friend. Now, for a long time, it was believed that it's not possible during the bounds to keep this quantity positive. And if it, if it was true, this would really be a very basic test that it's failed, and we would have to stop, OK? But what we have shown is, if you look at the gamma evolution, here I show you actually a concrete example, and this is just a plot thereof. You again follow time. This is here, H is your, now you, you are familiar with. Here we have the ordinary Einstein contracting phase. Their gamma should be equal to H. We don't modify gravity. The whole, as Paul laid out, the whole idea is only to modify gravity at higher energies. And you see, this is where you would bounce, right? When H stops to sh stop shrinking, starts to grow, and bounces, goes to zero, H goes to zero, is the bounce. The scale factor switches monotony behavior, so H switches from positive to, uh, from negative to positive, and you arrive here that we today would call, uh, let's say, nucleosynthesis, and then start expanding again according to Einstein gravity, and so gamma again reduced to H. There is no braiding, and you just expand uh, as, as we measure today. Okay, so what you see here is, one thing that I emphasize, gamma tracking H when it's Einstein gravity, it's identical to H, but it's very different from H uh, during, the, during, the, during the bouncing phase. So what you have to really check is, okay, that is one point that you should feel really uncomfortable with. But before you check that one point, in, oh, sorry, okay, that doesn't work, oh, thank you. It was taught to me, but I forgot, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, if, you, if you just check the bouncing phase, you see that gamma doesn't do much there. So if you were only interested in the case that during this bouncing phase, this very finite phase, you have a slightly shrinking gamma, but nothing really happens, then you know you are fine. So that's good news. Because you don't really have a problem of having a sick bounce phase by necessarily having a sick evolution, a really elliptic equation that would describe the gauge invariant variable, which would be from the perspective of the initial value problem, a catastrophe, already for this ordinary differential equation that, would, that should describe in order to be predictive. These are the modes that should at some point be in your microwave background, a code and hotspot. And if you would break down already at this level, that would just be nothing. That would, you would have a completely unpredictive theory. So the good news is that the problem 
doesn't happen during the balance phase. Now that's important because as I emphasize, you know, and I should emphasize this was in earlier works, because we very often tend not to think about things that we already know from a new perspective. We immediately assume if we ever encounter a problem during the evolution, that was really the case in earlier papers and many papers, that the reason is the bounce. So it's really important to disentangle if you encounter a pr problem as a first step to the solution to the problem. What is the real reason of the problem? So, and, and so what I wanted to want to really emphasize is it is even already progress if you can say what was not the source of the problem. So what you can see is because then you know. One way you could bounce in these theories is that your future is asymptotically Einstein gravity, but the past not, okay? But this is not what we are interested in. We are actually interested in theories where you can modify gravity only at the high energies around the bounce and reduce to Einstein both before and after the bounce. And then I want to mention the problem, okay? So it's not a new problem, it's the problem whether you can be reducing to Einstein gravity before and after the bounce, and you have to ask, well, what's happening here? Now, why is this here a problem? This is a problem where this parameter gamma crosses zero. Does it have to do it? Obviously, it's had to do it, because if you want to be Einstein before and after the bounce, gamma has to assume to h after and before the bounce. So what you really have to do is, you not just have to cross bounce h, but you have to bounce in some sense. It's a uh, um, gamma. And that means gamma will have a zero crossing. And what happens there, look at this equation. One over zero is not a good news. Okay? So that doesn't look good for a second. But what looks good is, if you again step back, so is it unavoidable or is it something that might not be as, as bad as it looks? And if I introduced it this way, you know that it's probably the second case. So we know one thing in relativity, and I would love to actually give the rest of the talk on this, this part of the story, but I think there is something more interesting to tell, therefore I just summarize you the, the takeaway lesson. So what's really important in general relativity is when you encounter something that looks like a point-like blow up, you, before you declare um, catastrophe, you have to check for one thing. And this is whether it's due to the dynamics encountering a bad slicing. And now we have to again step back and talk about the one aspect of gauge invariance that we almost never have to encounter in other contexts in cosmology. And this is the fact that gauge invariant variables are not curvature invariants. So they are, why they are really um, invariant under infinitesimal coordinate transformation, it, they don't save you from the fact that you have to check whether the space-time slicing is at every time well-defined. And we know this, this from black hole physics very well. We know it from the Schwarzschild metric blowing up around the horizon. But there is, in cosmology, also a context within Einstein gravity where we can see it much simpler. And the gamma crossing will be an analogy to that. When Paul answered Jim's question whether we can go where it's easy to go from an expanding phase to a contracting phase, then the answer was yes. Uh, and it is true, you don't have to modify gravity. And the only thing what you have to uh, take uh, is a little negative dip, a slight negative dip in the potential would be enough. So if you imagine this field that should be rolling from an exp accelerated expanding phase to a contracting phase, then there is one point within Einstein gravity where h crosses zero, namely when it goes from expansion to contraction. And what am I talking here about this? Well, because there is a coordinate singularity if you are, for example, in a gauge where the scalar fields uh, that people and many people, especially those who, know, uh, uh, who do effective filtering, very often utilize, it is a so-called unitary gauge. In unitary gauge, it's very convenient to calculate, again, as many of you know, because we can turn off the scalar field perturbations and promote all the perturbations of the special metric into the metric itself, into the scalar parts of the metric. And then what was on the previous slide, zeta, becomes your, in Einstein gravity, your co-moving curvature mode. But the associated slice has, all, of course, linearized time uh, variation, so that there is a, what we call lapse. This is the perturbations of the G00, or the time uh, element of the metric. And we have the shift, which is the perturbation, the linearized perturbation here, of the zero i components of the metric. 
And what it turns out in the simple Einstein gravity case is that um, both are inverse proportional to the Hubble parameter. So what happens? If h goes to zero within Einstein gravity, we know physically everything is perfectly fine. But what really happens is your lapse, your time, linearized time and shift parameter change monotony behavior, and there is one point when the slicing blows up. And this is what's called a coordinate singularity. How does one show that it's a coordinate singularity? One goes to a different gauge. And as soon as one finds a gauge where it's fine, then one is fine. <laughs> and, and this is actually something that Paul and David Garfinkel and Franz Pretorius uh, uh, worked on in a very nice paper by simulating exactly this phase. So uh, one, one, one can even prove it non-perturbatively. There's absolutely no problem. You just have to go out for that moment or around that point from the gauge. And this is really important to note that gauge invariant variables are extremely powerful, but they st don't, still don't save you from every possible catastrophe that they can do. So, uh, and now I have to refer to a paper. It turns out that it is a similar case in the gamma crossing because gamma not just measures at the background level the, the deviation from, from H, so the strength of braiding between the scales, kinetic energy, and geometry, but it turns out that it also replaces H in the relations that I was just talking about. So if you remember, I said that when you went from contraction to expansion, the time, for example, the time coordinate of the linearized metric, the lapse was inverse proportional to H. Now, gamma replaces H also here. So it becomes inverse proportional to, uh, the, sh the lapse becomes inverse proportional to, to um, gamma now, and the shift too, uh, actually to gamma square. So what happens is, whenever gamma goes to zero, the slicing that's associated with zeta or delta phi. So exactly that equation that I once shown you, at that point around that point becomes singular. So you have to go out into a different gauge. Uh, you have to, because it's not convenient. But it's very often the case in GR that for certain calculations, you cannot take the shortest uh, shortcut. And if you go into the so-called Newtonian or zero shear gauge and do the calculations as we did, and I uh, here have to refer to this paper, but I'm also happy afterwards to answer questions, the bottom line is you can save the day. That the evolution is fine. And you don't do anything, anything wrong to your theory. You don't turn off any coupling parameter. You don't uh, uh, do anything with the gravitational constant. Everything is remaining fine from the physical point of view. Um, but you have to go into a different gauge. Now, again, you see, I would be tempted to talk more about this, but I think there is something more important to do. So I uh, would really continue here with test number three. So if you were a cosmologist, you might ask me, what are you doing now, right? Because the test what we do usually is we don't, don't start to do something really difficult when we reach the stage when we know that we can evolve our gauge invariant perturbations. We might go to particle physics. We might want to check if our theory fits with, let's say, string theory or some UV-complete theory. We might want to see strong coupling issues, all uh, concepts that uh, you necessarily or maybe immediately would want to call me out and ask me for, but that's not what I want to do. What I want to do is something that you should not feel too comfortable with, but it's great. <laughs> so I will step out of cosmology for the next step, for the remaining part of the talk, for the next 20 minutes, and do something that the relativists are more familiar with in their own context, but not in the context that I will show you. And I really consider this as a crucial step to establishing balances, non-singular balances, to look at these theories as gravitational theories more seriously. And in order to do so, um, let's devote a minute to the greatness of GR, and then afterwards I leave it behind. So when we do cosmological perturbation theory, the reason why we can reduce the, the, the analysis and use the the, the concept that was developed in the early and mid 80s by gentlemen here in the audience, because we know from mathematicians how wonderful GR is. Um, and because I find her incredible inspiration, I think every time when I can, when I, can I mention it. And we really thank this woman who, who is still alive, Yvonne Shoke Bruhad, who has, who has and, and she's really a great inspiration. I think she would deserve a lot more mentioning, even in the physics contest, not just among mathematicians. Uh, she has. She proved the global appositeness of Einstein gravity. And what is that? This is really important. Um, or no, sorry, the nonlinear appositeness of Einstein gravity. I know I have here relativists, so if I misspeak about something, um, 
I'm a learner. So many people know here who know me, I'm still learning this stuff. And I hope that I make good progress, but I'm happy to be corrected. So this is also leaving my own comfort zone. I'm trained as a cosmologist. Um, why is it important about GR that the theory is web posted? Well, we take it for granted, but as I mentioned, we really deal here with a coupled nonlinear system of partial differential equations. And in order for uh, this system <coughs> to be treated as a physical theory, um, mathematicians, mathematical relativists, numerical relativists very often quote this definition of Hadamard, who said the theory is well posed if for a given or a given initial value problem is well posed. If you if there is a solution, the solution is unique and it depends continuously on the initial data. And we know this to be true for GR in its full nonlinearity. That's, that's great, right? Because we know that we deal with a theory that for initial data gives us, and that's what Paul called deterministic theory, definite predictions. And therefore, we can rest on that, on, on these really safe grounds, move on, simplify our calculation, and only study the evolution of the amplitudes of our perturbations in terms of ODEs. But now if you leave GR, all this wonderful um, result about GR is not there anymore. So if you go beyond GR, you can walk to a mathematician and ask, can you tell me if my theory is well posed so that I can reduce again the analysis of something simpler? And they will tell you, sorry, we don't have the tools for that yet. So when we modify gravity in a classical way, then I think it's a really important aspect that we have to appreciate even in the cosmology context that if we do this, that this problem arises. So we really have to go back to the, to the level of the partial differential equations and ask these questions whether the solutions around the perturb make any sense. Because if this, this problem is not solved, or if we have no hint that this problem can be solved, then the following happens really arbitrarily small wavelength fluctuation can carry away the system from a background solution. And your studying of the, of the evolution of the, of the amplitudes just doesn't correspond to anything that you can rely on because the solution, it does, it, the, 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 you cannot see if the solution that you assume to be existing is really there. Because for given initial data, you cannot be sure about that anymore. So, and therefore, we have to check. So if we want to move on, we have done the checks what you would do within classical, within cosmological theories with scalar fields minimally coupled to gravity. But if we pass those checks, if we didn't pass those checks, we can really stop. But if we pass those checks, we really have to step back and start to handle the issue without having the real mathematical, tool, mathematical tools for it, uh, for the full nonlinear theory. So and really for the remaining, 10 to 15 minutes of my talk, I want to go through the first results that we got and why we think um, that it looks better than we would have thought and we can move on with the ultimate aim of studying the nonlinear regime of these theories on the computer. Okay, so how do we deal with this issue? First of all, I again have to step back and remind you that a very important aspect of the scalar vector tensor decomposition that is really the underlying principle of the study of gauge invariant variables is uh, the ADM formulation of the, of the Einstein equations. And this really was understood or already in the 40s, which I find amazing by Lifshitz, who introduced the scalar vector decomposition, that if you take the ADM formulation, you can utilize the symmetries of an FRW background and decompose the metric. But an issue of the differential equation, the well-posedness issue, is usually for generic backgrounds, so you cannot just rely on one background. And we also know that the ADM formulation of the Einstein equation is unfortunately opposed. So it's really important also to realize uh, that well-posedness is really the feature of the differential equation system, the partial differential equation system, and not of the theory. So we can have a formulation of the theory that's well-posed. That's what we learned from Shoke Bruhan of the Einstein equation, but there is another formulation, the ADM formulation, that's the opposite, okay? So it, it's really important uh, to appreciate this because now we have to go out of this, for cosmologists, so familiar formulation and go over to a formulation that is very familiar to, to relativists, 
both mathematical and numerical. And this is the so-called, this is the generalized harmonic formulation. Uh, now, the defining feature of this formulation is that you require the coordinates to obey themselves a wave equation, and here the j mu, what I will call j mu, is the so-called harmonic source function. F in four space-time dimension, you have four such source functions. So you can think of this as either a vector-like equation or four scalar equation. And you also have to appreciate, and it's really important, that this definition itself yet is not a formulation choice, it's a gate choice. It really becomes a formulation when you consider these j's, the source function at dynamical quantities, and supplement the Einstein equations by equations for these quantities. If you do that, we know that, for example, in the case of Einstein gravity, you get a full wave equation. And that, that, that's really the wonderful feature of the, uh, of the harm generalized harmonic coordinates. Harmonic coordinates are called those where you set the source function to zero. And you also see here you have a freedom how to set these, these, these source functions. So what one can also state is, this is not a particular case, Joyce, but as a matter of fact, by way of choosing an appropriate source function, you can represent every single gauge. So also the gauges that we know and love from cosmology in this formulation. And we will utilize that too. <coughs> Maybe not within this talk, but I will refer to that. So this seems to be a good starting point. And let me just walk through. So when you write down the system of partial differential equations of your modified Hondeski theory, then it will look like this. It's, it's not really messy. <laughs> it's, I should refer to it. We have a new paper that just came out last night for, for more details. Um, you find also there the equations and how it looks, if you are curious, and I hope that you are curious. So how it looks is we know we have uh, emphasized throughout the talk. We have a second order system in time. As is a, we linearize it, so I should also say we absolutely don't have tools to analytically study the full nonlinear theory. So what we do is we study the linearized Horneski theory in the generalized harmonic formulation. And it will look like it's a second order equation. So we have second order time, second order spatial derivatives, time space, and here all the rest. Now, that positiveness is a statement about modes, short wavelength modes. So what we are interested in is are the second derivatives. And the coefficient matrix of the second derivatives are all uh, 11 dimensional matrices corresponding to the 10 linearized metric elements and the linearized scalar field. Um, and it is wonderful really without knowing um, how the theory looks um, in, in its linearized form. It looks a little messy, but in the terms of these matrices, we can understand it fairly quickly. First of all, let me just pan back and say that in the case of Einstein gravity, so if we didn't have this braiding, then all these matrices were diagonal matrices. And on a homogeneous background, we are still, all the study is done, what I'm showing you in homogeneous background. On a homogeneous background, this day matrix with the coefficient matrix would be zero. We wouldn't have a cross and time derivative term. And that's, fairly, that, and that, that, that's really simple, right? And you can see it here visually and both mathematically that the modification in these Horneski theories that, I'm, that we are studying is introduced by having non-trivial of diagonal elements of these coefficient matrices. And all the mass, in some sense, that, that, that makes it so non-trivial to show their positiveness already at the linear level, already or in just homogeneous or FRW background, comes from these terms. Okay, and we really don't have mathematical handle on them, so we just have to study the system in the most pedestrian way and hope that what we find is good enough. Um, so these are the terms that characterize, and they are all the 11th column of these matrices. They characterize, when I told you, if you remember, on the first or second slide, you have to remember that there is a double, phi double dot term, so second derivative of the scalar entering the second Friedman equation. That was one such term that appears already at the linear level. That's when you see braiding because that characterizes that the Einstein equation that normally with minimally coupled scalar don't entail second derivatives of the scalar, now entail second derivatives of the scalar. That's what we have to deal with. 
So this is how one sees the modification of gravity at the level of the partial differential equations. Okay, and again, uh, we do a standard technique to study this system because if I step back just a bit, there is one more problem. Um, why we have to be creative. These matrices are not constant. So usually we love differential equations when we know that the coefficient matrices are more or less constant, or at the very least don't entail derivatives. Now we are here in the linearized theory, so we don't have to worry about derivatives because these are all background dependent coefficients. But what we have to worry about is these are time varying coefficients. So in order to get some handle on the system, we use so-called frozen coefficient approximation where we want to look at the system at any possible point in time and space. Okay, so we do that. And so far I just described you how the system looks in this language. When we cannot go out in this really nice and convenient decomposition and reduce things to studying of ordinary differential equations. Now in this case, the standard trick is of course to further raise your dimensions but simplify the system. And coming from a second to a first order system, uh, you will have a 22 dimensional uh, vector and a 22, dimension, 22 times 22 uh, matrix that describe the evolution of this vector. And the principal symbol of this matrix, 22 by 22 matrix, is the one that characterizes the second derivatives. So here you have the 11 identity matrix that just tells you that V dot is V dot. And here is everything. We had just, we had just been normalized by the kinetic coefficient A, so that we have here a normalized kinetic energy or uh, time evolution of the field. We have here the two times spatial derivatives and the spatial and time derivatives from the system, from the equation. And all the high frequency or long or short wavelength behavior reduces to studying using good old linear algebra, the system. And first of all, we have to check for weak hyperbolicity. And in fact, as we have shown in this paper, you can see it, it can be proven that when you do the ODE checks, what I started with in text, test number two, when you do the check of the sound speed squared of the mukhanov sasaki equation, then what you really check is, is this weak hyperbolicity. That's what you really do. And in Einstein gravity, it turns out, this is wonderful because we have diagonal matrices, so nothing can mess up that system. So we also have explained here that's really sufficient as long as you don't modify gravity. Uh, and most of the, if you have, especially if you have a canonical scalar, then you are safe. But in this case, you only test weak hyperbolicity. And weak hyperbolicity is not enough. Now, first of all, let me just mention you that this matrix, because it also represents the wonderful uh, um, well behavior of Einstein gravity that I was emphasizing and tells you how we modify things. Um, this principal symbol has uh, of course, a 22 times 22 matrix, so it has four different eigenvalues. These two eigenvalues come, are inherited from Einstein gravity, and they both have 10 corresponding eigenvectors, which are linearly independent. And this is all the inherited structure from Einstein gravity, because we use the harmonic formulation, so the matrices that would describe only the Einstein gravity are the same. But now we add to this the scalars, and they have um, two associated eigenvalues. And these were actually exactly, and one can show it and prove it, that these are exactly the, the, uh, the CS square, so the square of this quantity is exactly the same quantity that was the sound speed of the mukhanov sasaki variable. So this is a nice connection. But we are not done. So in Einstein gravity with a canonical scalar, we were done, but now we are not, because we have to check. So when I define the posedness, uh, then I now complement it by saying that many times a way of showing that posedness is to sto uh, show that the system of partial differential equation is strongly hyperbolic. So if we want to show the linearized well posedness of our theory on an FRW background, then we want to see that not just are the eigenvalues all real, but the, the eigenvectors build a complete set. And this is something you could not see from the linear theory as done in cosmology. This is really a structure of the PDEs, that that's what it characterizes, the partial differential equation. And first it might look messy, but it turns out that everything can be expressed about these eigenvectors in terms of the propagation speed, so the eigenvector of the, that we know the Mankind of Sasaki variable, and the braiding parameters of the matrix. So you see again, if there was no braiding, 
this was trivial, especially if you have the canonical scalar with some speed one, then everything, then I haven't yet, uh, because short of time and space, uh, but I have to assert here uh, without showing it that these two eigenvectors are linearly independent of the 20 eigenvectors associated with the, with the um, Richard tensor, so the Einstein sector of the, of the thing, and the modification sector introduces very non-trivial eigenvectors. So with the non-modified gravity, all these Vs and Ws would be zero. But you have now here these braiding terms from the coefficient matrices of the PDE, and they are non-zero. So now you have to check that around your background, these eigenvectors are, so you see it, when you have, first of all, a CS that is real, then you are fine, but now you have to check that they are bounded, so they cannot blow up, okay? Because that gives you what relativists call an energy condition of the system, which leads to the fact that if you have a system of a complete set of eigenvectors, and you can only have it when they are well-behaved, that means finite, then when you start in a background solution, then you have shown, and that's what we have shown, that arbitrarily small wavelength fluctuations cannot carry you immediately away from the system. And this is really important, because even if you think, oh, um, this is all that mathematics, and why do I have to do this? Well, I think, I hope, I convince you it's important, because we left Einstein gravity. But it has also very pragmatic importance. What our ultimate goal is, and this relates to Dick's question, to study the bounds, really the absolute structure of the bounds. And this theory is manifest and nonlinear. So you cannot stop studying the nonlinear, uh, the linearized theory, or go to second order and perturbations. You really have to go to a full nonlinear regime. And what this calculation enables us is that you will have a finite time where you shouldn't crash. So if, if we had failed this test, again, so I want to put it into this, so if I failed this test, then I would be standing here today and said, this way we cannot make a bounce. Then we would know it. But the fact that we, we passed this test on, on uh, Friedman, Roberts, and Walker background means that you can, we can move on and really start testing the nonlinear regime. And this will be also the point where I want to stop. So what comes next? I reached test four, <laughs> and um, we are not done. We are not done. I think it's a good first step, or a good 0.5 steps to start with. What we want to do next is go and, and put the theory in the computer and see uh, how well we did and how far can we go with the numerical integration, how robust is the system, without knowing from mathematicians anything about it more than what I have shown. And then, of course, the ultimate goal is we don't do it just because we are interested in having a theory that's mathematically consistent, that's nonlinearly working. We really are interested in how can we distinguish this theory from other competing models that, for example, assume a, um, assume a beginning for the universe. So what we really hope is, and this is something that I won't have time here anymore, so let me just briefly mention it, that this uh, way of studying, so our motivation is the bounds. Our motivation is to establish it both on a theoretical, nonlinear level, and also to study perturbations. But, but, but we are developing a scheme, I should say, that we are aware it should be used for a lot more purposes. So the fact that we are in this generalized harmonic formulation, this makes it a little bit more complicated to extract observables directly. On the other hand, it will give us a new handle to extract cosmological observables directly from the nonlinear full non-perturbative simulation, which I hope that many of you will use, even if you work on other, other, other um, type of cosmologies. It should be very useful, especially given the fact that the experimentalists are really so advanced and so far ahead on, on many counts uh, that they are able to measure structures that would not be captured with the linear theory and might not even be captured with the second order theory, so that we might need really the full non-perturbative analysis and hopefully find features that then make the Simon's Observatory and other microwave background and, and cosmological surveys more interesting. Thank you.